So today we're uh, bringing to you part of our ongoing Simulation Month series, which is a series of activities here in the month of May, where we're presenting a variety of different information about analysis tools that can help in your uh, design process. In today's session, we're going to focus on looking at options and strategies and techniques that we can use for a structural analysis, which generally take to encompass um, any type of stress analysis that's generally in a static formulation or quasi-static formulation. Um, my name is Glenn White. I oversee many of the simulation products that we have and here at Hawkridge Systems. And uh, with me on the line, I'll say Tim Milo, who's our Simulia product manager. And between the two of us, we're going to take you through a number of different options, strategies, uh, considerations to make when, when doing static stress analysis, and a look at the different tools and services that can help you out with this process. Before we dive in too quickly, I do want to make sure that we're all on in sync in how to use this uh, GoToWebinar package that we uh, that we use for these sessions. So just to kick off, everything you're going to control about your interaction with us here today is through the GoToWebinar control panel. You'll probably see that to the top right of your screen, compressed into a um, you know a section of the screen. Um, and this will control the things like your audio option. You have the option to use your computer speakers or to use the um, the dial-in number, the telephone option. And you also got the ability to control the, the view size. Right, so the screen size I'm using right now will be pretty much what we're going to be at throughout the presentation. So you can control the zoom state at your end. Uh, lastly, if you have any questions on the content or have a problem with the presentation, or the GoToWebinar, use the question section of GoToWebinar to send something in. Really encourage you to put something in if you're curious about something or if something doesn't quite make sense. Uh, we'll pause at a few points during the presentation to address those questions and uh, if we can get a good conversation going, it's always a little more interactive for everyone. Okay, so with that, you know, we'll talk about what we're going to cover over the next uh, less than an hour, around an hour or so. So, you know, part of what we're doing here is to give you an idea of the different options that are available. There's a couple of different software packages. There's a variety of different ways you can learn about doing better stress analysis that we will cover. And we generally advocate an approach of starting simple and getting more complex incrementally. We're going to do exactly the same thing in this presentation. We're going to start with kind of the simplest stress analysis you can do, a linear static structural stress analysis, and then add complexity to it. Uh, look at examples that start to include nonlinearity or nonlinear phenomena, and then we'll look at making your design better. Uh, with a couple of approaches to optimization, and then we'll talk about some of the future capabilities that we, we may end up at. So, you know, we pride ourselves on the, the analysis work we do um, over the last, over our history. We've evolved from you know, being a simple uh, SolidWorks reseller, where we had one kind of stress analysis product, to now having a complete suite of software and services. Uh, we've gone out and sourced some other software packages and brought other services on stream. Uh, to meet our customers' needs that, that we've been told about over the years. And, you know, just in general, you know, the SolidWorks and Hawkridge Systems package is, is getting more and more extensive, covering more and more of the product realization and, and design process. 
Um, and analysis is a significant part of that. Um, but as you can see, there's many other capabilities that, that we're now able to offer if you're interested in any of those. Now, you'll see a few, you see a ton of different modules that we'll, we'll put up on the screen today. Analysis packages, especially the way analysis vendors like to write about them, they can be overwhelming. And it's hard to understand, um, you know, what one package does well over another approach or another package. So we like to talk about three things that we think the tools that we have here at Hawkridge Systems do better than anything else in the market. And, and primarily we're talking about SOLIDWORKS simulation tools in that realm. So first of all, most of these tools, these tools are designed to be used by kind of any designer or engineer with an understanding of the basic physics. You do not need to be an expert in FEA to effectively use a SOLIDWORKS stress analysis tool. So the software is going to make some smart decisions for you. It's going to guide you through the workflows. Uh, it's going to tell you how to check your answer to make sure you did things correctly. Um, and that should shorten the learning curve to get you getting good results as quickly as possible. The other thing is it's completely integrated into the CAD system. Uh, this will mean that if you want to make a design change, you change the geometry on the screen, the analysis model will instantly update. You hit run, it'll process, and you'll see the, the result of your design change uh, virtually instantaneously. And lastly, we are a single source solution. Uh, we provide consulting, training, technical support, put resources on the web for all the tools we sell, so we're never going to refer you to, to anyone else. Uh, we're, we're able to handle the, handle the full spectrum of your analysis needs um, through our technical support and uh, engineering staff. We should be able to help you out. So when we talk about analysis products, we, we generally have four major ones, but, but technically five. The SOLIDWORKS motion simulation is a comes SOLIDWORKS Premium and it's a little bit of a niche product, but um, today if we're talking about linear static structural analysis, there's two, two software tools that we're going to contrast. SOLIDWORKS Simulation, uh, which you get some elements of, and SOLIDWORKS Premium that is available in three packages otherwise, SOLIDWORKS Simulation Standard, Professional, and Premium and Simulia Abacus, which is a um, uh, high-level, very powerful um, analysis tool that can do, handle some really complex problems and situations, and we'll look at a couple of those. <coughs> now, in terms of, other than the software capability, something that people don't always consider when making their decisions is, is kind of this concept of how much help do I how much help will I need? What style of help works best for my workflow? And we have help and assistance offerings that range all the way from the free stuff we put on YouTube and our blog and our website through technical support, which is part of your subscription service contract. There's dedicated classroom training which you know, has you sitting down with a, an experienced instructor, working through standard problems to apply general best practices um, to your analysis situations, and you know, get a fundamental understanding of how the tool works and how to manipulate it. But then we can take it up a level of complexity and offer mentoring, and mentoring is basically the application of the product to your specific situation um, where we'd have an engineer work through essentially your first problem with you and, and train you on the pros and cons of different thought uh, approaches, you know, the best practices for that specific problem and um, develop, you know, a kind of custom workflow for you there. And of course we also offer 
straight up consulting, or if you want someone to take on the job for you, um, we can address that. Okay, so let's start with with an example. Then you know, we'll start with what we call the bread and butter of stress analysis, a linear static stress analysis example. There is a flavor of this in every license of SOLIDWORKS. Under the tools menu, you'll see Simulation Express. And that's a limited uh, package that will do part level analysis only, so one part at a time. With limited controls and capabilities, uh, but still using the fundamental same engine as what I'm going to show you here. Now, linear static stress analysis lets you see how strong our components are. It will report the stress and the displacement uh, under certain loading conditions and let you evaluate you know, whether you've passed any sort of failure uh, value in terms of the stress. And you can define that failure value, your level of risk that you're willing to take on, you know, the nature of where this is going into, That'll all determine how you define your failure value. Uh, but this lets you basically review whether you're going to have something that's strong enough to do the job. So how does it work? So this is a an engine mount bracket. I'm going to be playing with this, this design a little bit today. Okay, but it's a part that's been designed in SolidWorks sheet metal. You can see I've got a bracket. Uh, there's various engine load values that we're going to attach to all these tabs and uh, it's going to be mounted, it's going to be bolted to this base frame here that I've sketched a small section of. So we're just in SOLIDWORKS right here, right, it's a uh, regular old SOLIDWORKS. I've turned on SOLIDWORKS simulation, tools, add-ins, simulation, and Uh, we can create as many design scenarios as we like within this model. So I'm going to new study here. And when we set up the study, we basically just work through the tree from top to bottom, identifying the things the software wants us to review, and uh, go for that. So we'll start at the top which is our parts list. Um, the software will do a couple of things out of the box. Right? It'll identify the, the components that we have, and there's two, there's the bracket, and then this kind of base frame here. But it also look to the SOLIDWORKS tree and say, you know, did we define a material when we designed this part? And if we did, it will map that over to the stress analysis. So that'll be the stiffness, the Poisson's ratio, the yield strength, all that sort of stuff. If we want to do a what-if study and look at something else, no problem. We can just change it in the analysis case, and it won't push back to the model. Right? So we can explore what happens if we make this of a higher alloy steel, or um, you know, what if we go to aluminum, all those sort of scenarios. The other thing it's done is a little bit subtle here, um, and it's but it's very, very intelligent. Uh, the part we're looking at that's highlighted in the blue is, is a sheet metal component. Um, you know, it can be flattened into its existing shape, so there's no, no issues there. Um, but the thing about sheet metal stuff is it's thin. It has a dimension in the thickness direction that's a lot smaller than, than anything else. And that can represent a challenge from a meshing perspective sometimes. So we're going to put very small mesh elements to capture that thickness accurately. Um, but if we do that everywhere, we might end up with a lot of mesh elements, which means a big complex model. So the way we deal with a lot of stuff like sheet metal is we turn it into a 2D uh, surface uh, called a shell mesh, pretty standard formulation for something like sheet metal, basically to represent it with a two like a 2D surface. See the orange component there, it has no thickness. Um, 
Rope said it's a 2D surface that has an equivalent strength or equivalent stiffness of the real 3D, I think it's 1.2 millimeter thickness. Cool thing about SolidWorks, it will make this abstraction for you completely automatically. If it detects sheet metal features have been used to build a component, um, it'll make that, that's the best and smartest approximation, it'll make that for you out of the box and it will handle all the transfer and loads and contact and everything else to this uh, kind of abstracted plane here, which otherwise would need to be managed manually, which can be a bit of a pain. Uh, if you don't like that, right click, treat as solid, and you've got a normal component that you'll mesh like anything else. So very easy to kind of modify that default behavior, but it's doing something smart for you out of the box, which is exactly what we're looking for. Okay, moving down, you know, the next uh, next thing to consider is how these parts interact with each other. Uh, we are talking about a uh, two parts here, so it's pretty simple. Okay. And so we can come in and uh, define the relationship between these two components. So we pick the faces, that interface. Okay. Um, and I'm going to define this contact called no penetration. Um, you know, no penetration means these two parts are not glued together, uh, they're not attached, but they are f the two parts are free to slide on each other, they're free to separate if loading causes that to happen, but they will not go through each other. Basically says the top part is resting on the bottom part, it's not glued or welded or fused together, it's resting. And that's okay, but we are going to want to couple it with something else. And in this situation, that something else is is a bolted connection. Um, we want to virtually represent the fact that we've got a bolt that rests, the head of the bolt rests there, and a nut that rests on the other side. And this virtual connector is, is more computationally efficient and actually gives you a couple more options than modeling a physical bolt part. Okay, and one of the main options it gives is it gives us the ability to define a, a preload, right, the torque value that we're tightening this bolt up to. Uh, we can very easily put that in place. And so we'd go through and we'd finish our four bolts. Let's see here. Um, by choosing this push pin here, I remember all my settings, so I just need to pick the new geometry for this bolt. Uh, I should point out the software is also, you know, measuring the diameter, making appropriate choices for the head size and the shank diameter. Uh, it's going to create a zone of pressure under the head. So it's a pretty detailed analysis. Um, and I'm feeling a bit lazy, so I've already done one here. But I'm going to grab one of the great things about SolidWorks is if you've already set something up in another study, you can drag and drop it to a different condition and it will it'll be in place. So we just dragged in those two definitions that I've done previously and uh, they're now present. Okay. Next step, let me see we have a Question here. Just uh, we'll, we'll pause and, and look at some questions in a minute, but if you have any, um, please feel free to send them in. Um, so, the next step in the process is to figure out how to restrain this. Okay, so, uh, we're basically removing the ability of certain positions in the model to move. And we do that by removing their degrees of freedom. Um, this is representing kind of the interaction between these pieces that I've modeled here and 
the wider world that we haven't modeled. And this is just part of a larger frame, so I'm going to make the assumption that the rest of that frame holds the ends here fairly stiffly, and so I'm just going to fix the ends of the model. The And then the last kind of phase that we need to contribute to is to define our loads. And we have a lot of different options available in terms of the different loads we can apply. Forces, torques, pressures, the weight of the object due to gravity, centrifugal loading if it's spinning, uh, temperature to see it expand and contract under temperature changes, all the stuff that we're going to want. And a lot of control over how we can define it. What I'm going to do here is define that I'm applying a load to these two holes. It's going to be applied normal to the surface, so I define a, a reference so that I've got you know this kind of abstracted angle that I'm going to utilize. And then you know, full control over unit system. <coughs> Let's say in this case, you know, two pounds per hole. And I want it in the backward direction. So everything I do goes in the tree. So if I make a mistake, it's very easy for me to go back and modify it. Okay. Um, I've got three other, four other positions. So I want to put loads in. I could make you watch me do that, but I'm feeling lazy. So I'm just, again, going to drag and drop those to populate essentially five uh, load cases, uh, load positions for this model. Okay, so that's all good. Um, that's kind of my work done in terms of an input. Uh, components and materials I've defined, how the parts interact, how the parts are held, how the parts are loaded, and then there are two pieces the software is going to take on for me. The first is to mesh the model. Now I can control this. I can identify regions of the model that I want to have finer mesh. I can manage mesh at different boundaries, but at its simplest, I tell it to go mesh it, define a general size, and it will go off and do it using tetrahedrons and triangles. And then the last part is to actually run the equations. And this, of course, the software is going to do for me as well. Uh, hit run, it's going to kick open a, a separate solder solver window. It's telling me that my bolt definition might not be the best choice for, for this, but I'll, I'll proceed with it. And it's going to run through the analysis process. About 45 seconds for this one here, so let's take that opportunity to have a look at it. If there's any questions. And there's a good one here from Andrew. Andrew's saying here, SolidWorks Professional, right? Um, and doesn't see simulation under tools add-ins. Right? So if you've got SolidWorks Standard or SolidWorks Professional, you have access to kind of a, a single part of the time stress analysis tool, and you'll find that under Tools Express Products Simulation Express. In 2015 and earlier, it's just Tools Simulation Express. If you've got SolidWorks Premium or one of the simulation packages, um, you want to go to Tools Add-ins. And if it's not there, um, we might need to have a look uh, at the, the Express version should be in every license solver. You'll see I have it here, even though I'm using the full simulation package. So we might have to follow up. Uh, see, Andrew saying through the questions that uh, it's not in that location, uh, but we'll follow up on that. Okay, and if there's any other questions, you know, simple stuff like that, clarifications, feel free to. Uh, to bring that in, and we'll, we'll be happy to check it out. Okay.
So now we're looking at a result. And look at the one that has that I did earlier. Um, but basically, bear with me here while this runs. We're going to review a couple of key parameters when we look at a result. Okay, we're going to look at the stress levels. We're going to comp and we can put these into whatever you know unit system or layout that we find we're most comfortable with. So I put my own PSI. It's kind of what I innately understand the best. I can look at the stress patterns through the model. I can drill in on different areas by changing the scale. Looks like I've got a bit of a stress riser occurring at this notch here. And uh, obviously stress and pressure under the bolts that have been defined. I want to go compare this to my failure stresses. I can look at the displacement. I can exaggerate that. So I can get a better kind of visual sense of what's going on, and I can animate. And so my primary mode is it looks like a twisting mode up in the um, up in that long tab. So we can look at that. Right, and evaluating you know is this within my requirements? Am I happy with this level of distortion under the slowdown? If not, I'll need to stiffen it up somehow. And then another factor we often look at is, is the factor of safety. And this is comparing the stress developed in the model to the yield stress of the components. Factor of safety of one is something that is exactly yielding under this load. And that's, that's kind of what we have here. It's very localized, this notch. Um, that be something to think about as we get through. Now the beauty of all this is that I always have access to my SOLIDWORKS model. So if there's a certain dimension, if I identify that I want that notch to be bigger, so it doesn't act as much of a stress riser, if I want to round the corners of it, or whatever I decide to do, I can make a modification to these dimensions live on the screen, and as soon as I do so, this software will be ready to reprocess that analysis on the design change be instantaneous. So that's uh, probably the quickest associativity that's available in a CAD or analysis package uh, today on the market. And we can really leverage that further when we start to optimize, and we'll look at that shortly. So that's kind of the, the most basic thing we can do. Linear static stress analysis on either a part or an assembly. You know, I don't want to write it off as being simplistic, but because it's probably 70 to 80 percent of the analysis done today. And even in situations where I'm going to do something more complex or more detailed or more realistic, I start with one of these. Just to make sure the system's moving as I expect, that I've got all my contacts and connections in place appropriately. Um, essentially checking I haven't made any mistakes. And to lay out what this like, looks like in context of you know, the SOLIDWORKS simulation offerings that are available, uh, what we just used is static stress analysis for assemblies. It's part of SOLIDWORKS simulation standard. And it goes all the way uh, from there. Now in terms of the context of what we're talking about today, the main kind of next step that we'll review, um, you know, while we have SOLIDWORKS simulation professional that can offer frequency and buckling, and uh, we'll look at the optimization tool in a bit. The main thing we're going to look at today is, is moving to a nonlinear scenario. Uh, nonlinear analysis allows us to kind of consider things more realistically, to make less assumptions, and we have a SOLIDWORKS simulation, nonlinear analysis that's pretty good, can handle you know, most kind of general problems. But there are problems that are too complex for it. And we're recognizing that a few years ago, we went out and sourced access to 
sommelier abacus for our customers. So we can offer a complete solution. And Tim's going to show uh, an example of that. Um, but let's consider this isolator example. Okay, basically, an, an isolates the shaft under different aspects of loading. And there are three things that make this nonlinear. The first is the main body of the isolator in the middle is a, is a rubber component. Uh, that rubber component does not have a linear stress strain curve. It exhibits hyperelastic material behavior. Um, so to excess anything that's not a linear material behavior, we need to get into to a nonlinear analysis type. Secondly, it's, undergo, it's going to undergo significant shape change. Now, if you take something like a bridge and you put a truck on it, you don't see the bridge move. The fundamental shape of the bridge doesn't change. And linear stress analysis makes a similar assumption. It assumes that the general shape, the general stiffness of the structure does not change significantly as the load is applied. Uh, we, we can't say that here. If you look at the animation that's playing, you see a very visible and noticeable shape change. And also, it's, it's a little harder to see, but um, a contact develops that isn't there at the start of the analysis as the, the shaft kind of moves to the I guess, left as you're looking at it, um, it comes into contact with the other uh, ring of, of the isolator. Lastly, it, um, we need to sequence behavior. And so what happens here is there's a small vertical load that's applied and then a large horizontal load is applied in a second step. Uh, that ability to kind of sequence actions under time is, uh, is a feature of a nonlinear analysis only. All right, so let's have a look here. Just grab that model. There we go. Now the cool thing about the little SolidWorks tools is that the the analyses look the same. It's a fundamentally different engine that's driving this, but my tree looks the same. It's familiar to me. So there's two things, three things that are unique here. One. I've got a hyperelastic material model. Okay, it basically says this is the best approximation for things like rubbers and silicones and thermoplastic elastomers and things like that. Um, I've got some definitions here where I've basically defined two constants against this formulation called Mooney Rivlin. But you'll we'll see this when Tim talks as well. The most common way manufacturers describe um, hyperelastic materials is to give you test data, to give you the results of a tension test, or give you the results of a, um, a biaxial shear test, or something like that. And you can read in those pieces of test data right into the software, and it will calculate the appropriate material constants that are needed. Um, that, that can be I'd say 90% of the time, that's how you define rubbers and something like this. Um, so that's the unique material, that rubber. Uh, I can tell the software that you know there is the potential for these parts to come together. And this is, unfortunately, one limitation of the SolarWorks simulation software. We need to identify where potential contact may come into place. I have to tell the software to be watching for the pink surface to run into the, well, what was the, the blue surface there. If I decide to pull it the other way, I'm going to go back and think about that again. Okay, it's not a big deal. It'll, it'll work here, but that's a point of contrast. And then with the loading, you know, I've defined an upward load, but I can control the time signature of what this looks like. So. There's no real concept of time here. It's a static analysis, but we use this thing called analysis time or pseudo time 
to sequence actions. Okay, so I'm going to say basically in the first half of the analysis, I want to apply this 800 Newton vertical load. Great. In the second half of the analysis, I then want to apply, so I've got nothing happening for the first half in this, this particular force, but a horizontal force of 2,500 Newtons that's going to kick in in the second half of the analysis. So again, that lets me sequence those actions. So when I go to solve it, you'll see a vertical movement and then a large horizontal movement. So those have been sequenced. Uh, if you look at a stress plot, we can see that, that contact forming. And um, you know, we can monitor the, the movement, the behavior of all these different things. Now, it should be noted that Solvix simulation and nonlinear analysis will have kind of a limit of how far you can distort and deform something. Um, and that depends on the material properties, the mesh, the loading scenario, the geometry of the part, you know, a lot of factors. Um, something like this is well within the realms of you know what SOLIDWORKS simulation can handle, but if you're really drastically crushing or crimping or um, doing things like that, you know, there may be a better approach. And Tim's going to uh, discuss that. Um, so yeah, this particular model got to you know 93, 94% of the loading with the default settings. Um, starting to have some trouble converging at the, the very extreme of the movement. Uh, with modifications to setting, a couple of tweaks to the settings, and uh, was able the solver settings is generally what we modify. Um, we're able to get the full load that we're looking for. All right, so let's take a sec look here. All right, so no other questions, but feel free to um, to send anything in that that you're curious about. I'm going to take this opportunity here though to hand over to to Tim and Tim's going to speak to the kind of the next step from SOLIDWORKS Nonlinear which is um, a package called Samoli Abacus. All right, thanks Glenn for the introduction. <clears throat> So I want to make sure everybody right now sees my screen okay. I'm uh, Yeah, it looks good. Okay, yeah. very good. So I'm going to go a little bit into uh, the, the overlap of functionality between Abacus and SolidWorks Simulation and also touch on where they're different. Um, similarly to SolidWorks Simulation, we can work with a few different types of physics. Uh, we have our, our Abacus standard tool, which is where you'll do most of your uh, nonlinear uh, static problems. And we also have uh, an extension of that called explicit where we might get into high energy impact type of simulations or extreme deformations in a, in a quasi-static application. And then we have Abacus CFD. Today I'm gonna focus in Abacus standard, but I wanna make you aware of, of all three of those products. So first, I'm going to kind of go into where they're, where they're similar and where they're different. Uh, Glenn touched on and showed how the analysis is really integral to the CAD package. Um, in Abacus, it's a little bit different in that we have a sort of a, a one-way geometry transfer from our CAD. Um, we can change some things once we've set up a model and maintain a lot of our mesh or boundary conditions, but it's really not as integral in that if if enough of the model changes, uh, you'll need to, to remesh anywhere that it's different and you'll lose the boundary conditions in areas where you changed. Uh, the, the workflows are not really built around wizards per se, but you have very tight control over all the material modeling techniques. There are several different material models available for rubber. We have some control over what type of failure models we use in our steel. Um, so in that sense, there's very rich control, uh, and you can you can get into things really as deep as you want. 
Um, there's no built-in material library per se, but you can copy material models from other analyses. Uh, something that I often do is, is go to the example library and, and look for a material model in a, a very specialized and deeply configured application. And the, the solver is a little different in that you can control how many, uh, how many cores you're going to run across and, and that's part of the, the overall packaging or the, the type of abacus that you buy. So I'm going to get into the same bushing application that Glenn covered. Um, and again, just kind of highlight when Abacus can benefit the user. When you get into large distortions, Abacus has a very robust nonlinear solver. Um, there's ways to automatically detect change in contact, and we have uh, the ability to sequence loads. And so one way that that will show up is that rather than everything happening in a, a single quasi-time step, we can split that into different time steps and turn loads on and off through those time steps. So now I'm going to come into the same uh, CAD model that Glenn started out with, the, the basic bushing, and I'll show you how that uh, connection to Abacus happens. So from SolidWorks, what I'll do is I'm going to export this and what we'll find is that we get the same basic assembly uh, locations and scaling that we came in from SolidWorks with. So once we're in Abacus, the first thing that I'll take you through is that we import and create a geometry. And I'm also going to introduce the, the model tree. So you can see we have You can see we have the same sort of basic tree set up over on the left. We have uh, different parts. And in that assembly, we have instances of those parts. We can access the different uh, parts of the, of the tree through this drop-down menu here. So the first step, once we uh, bring in our geometry, is to choose our analysis type. So I'm going to use a, a general static uh, analysis. And I'm just going to call that first step xload. And that's going to be the, the horizontal load that we put on there. We can control the incrementation. One of the things that we would anticipate is with a contact analysis, we don't want the first step to try to solve all the way through it. So I'm going to say go ahead and apply a fifth of the load. And I'll create a step for the Y load with the same approach. This one will also only go a fifth of the way on the first step. And one other tweak that I'm going to make here is we do know that we'll have nonlinear geometry from changing contact. So I'll set both of those steps to consider nonlinear geometry. We have some options around stabilization, but uh, we know that I know from, from running this that that's not going to be required. Um, so now in, in the load tree, we can see that we have discrete uh, events for each of those steps. The first thing I'm going to do after that is come over to create some material properties. We have some options there. Um, I've, I'm going to create a simple steel model and highlight how we can set our modulus of elasticity and our density if we want to. So for this one, all we need is a modulus of elasticity. I'm in um, meters, so I'll set that to 210 GPA and choose a Poisson's ratio. We have another option, which is to copy a material model from another, <clears throat> from another analysis. So I'm going to go ahead and choose the material models of rubber and steel from this one that I've already set up. So once we create a material model, we'll want to apply that to the particular sections. And so I'll, I'll apply the rubber material model and the steel material models to each of these parts. What that does is tie the element type and the material to the part. Once we have a mesh, all those things are assigned. So 
the next step after creating the materials we, which we can visualize what they are here in the assembly is going to be to detect which parts are in contact. So I'll come into the interaction module which is where we control the contact for the model. and I'm just going to choose general contact and what that means is that everything in the model is going to detect self-contact we can choose an interaction property which is where we assign uh, friction if we choose to have friction that's that's all available here I'm fine with the default properties which is no friction and um, penalty for reinforcement for penetration so with that we just create that in the initial step and that's basically detects throughout the whole analysis I'm going to go into sort of how we can create couples to, to create single points to track loads. So what I've done in this one is I created a reference point in the in the center of that bushing, and what that is, is is a single point where we can apply a load and track displacement over time. <clears throat> and what that allows us to do is essentially track a, a spring constant for this bushing, so that we get an idea of uh, the the response. To loads in each direction because that's that's going to be one of our key output parameters of this type of analysis and I've, I've gone ahead and tied rather than do contact between the bushing and the metal I've said that they're going to essentially be bonded uh, since that's the the way these are made so once I set up the the contact I'm going to go into the loads here I've set up the the boundary conditions ahead of time and what I've done is I've fixed each of these holes to be fully constrained and I've created a time history for X and Y loads so similarly to Glenn's problem I have a 2500 Newton and an 800 Newton load uh, we can move these left or right if we want to shift which one happens first so once we've set our material properties our boundary conditions and our loads um, we're ready to, to run a job. So I've also run this job ahead of time. I can tell you it took about 20 minutes on this computer. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and skip over to the post-processing uh, visualization module so I can show you how this analysis behaves. So we have a visualization of the, uh, the deformation of the model. Uh, we can watch any single result if I want to plot the displacement over time or strain so we're, here we're looking at the strain we have a, you know the most strain in the rubber around the junction with that pin another thing that we can do I mentioned that I created a central point to track uh, the force and displacement so here as we apply our our force over time we also have a displacement result we can pull that out into Excel if we want to do things like calculate a spring constant or here in the tree we can plot one divided by the other. So that's a sort of a quick run through of how we can handle this this bushing analysis in Abacus. You know, a lot of the same sort of functionality in terms of a tree and uh, the way we apply our loads and one of the unique points I, I would say being that we have discrete steps and we also have the ability to control you know to ramp those at, through different uh, amplitude course or to go in the quasi time time to full load at each step so uh, after going through the this bushing problem you know I kind of introduced you to the the seven different parts of the tree how we import and we choose our study type, we create a material model, and uh, you <clears throat> use our surface interactions to detect contact, and then last, how we uh, apply the, the loads and boundary conditions and pull the, the key results out. So next, um, Glenn and I are going to go through some examples of applications of this in our services.
So I'll hand it over to Glenn to go through the SolidWorks simulation services we've done. Yeah, we, you know, we've found it really interesting over the last four years. Um, we've been working with a lot of our customers on you know, helping them with their specific problems, and I find it really interesting to showcase the types of things that people use, in this case, nonlinear analysis for. So we wanted to share a couple of those cases, give you a sense of kind of types of problems you can solve, and also the types of service that you can get help with. So this one is a, a major automotive brake manufacturer. Um, they have a particular test they run uh, where they put a brake through a number of consecutive braking events to see how f the distortion from, from the thermal heat up of that affects the mechanical behavior of it. Now, it's a fairly complex physical test. It requires some pretty heavy hardware. You've got to build the brake and the hub and the wheel and all that good stuff. So we were able to help them develop a method for doing both a thermal and a stress analysis um, to replicate that test so they can put it earlier in the design process. And the second one that I'll showcase we saw with simulation nonlinear for medical device manufacturer has a component in their surgical actuator that they're currently making from ceramic and they were considering moving to um, the thermoplastic, an injection mold of thermoplastic. Uh, they wanted to validate that it would do its job before they spent twenty, thirty thousand dollars on the tool, and we were able to help them validate by testing that new part that in their current configuration it would not work, um, and and we're working on helping them work on some design changes from there. Um, so yeah, Tim has a couple of examples. So yeah, similarly to these, sorry, Glenn. Uh, similar to these <laughs> applications in simulation, we've I've had a, a few Abacus consulting projects. One was for a medical device manufacturer using uh, scanned, uh, scanned FEA model from the body with something on the order of 50,000 uh, unique surfaces. We have we had a prosthetic device that we needed to track the the force response with the body. Um, this had you know a, a very large uh, implementation of that audit, the general contact. And what we did was we were able to simulate this thing going through some pretty high strains and get a, a, a good match within 10% of laboratory test data. So this is a step towards replacing physical testing with uh, very detailed finite element models. Uh, another application that we had was for a, a steel, a steel uh, earthquake reinforcement frame uh, manufacturer. Again, it was a physical test that they needed to replicate. This one was much more, say, normal geometry, just involving, um, you know, kind of idealized plate and beam structures, and we were able to match their test results within 1%. So this is a case where you have a very detailed model of, of the steel stress strain response, and you have a, a fairly simple structural model, and we were able to you know, come very close to test results. And again, it's an initiative to replace physical testing with analysis. Awesome. So, you know, what we're seeing over and over in the industry is, you know, definitely this movement of analysis from being a final stage in the process to to something we do or companies do early in the design phase as part of a design exploration effort. Um, and kind of connected to that is starting to talk about optimization. All right, so if we go back to our bracket we started with, if we're talking about you know, our first stress analysis, we finish that, we get a result, we're in, we're in one of two situations. Either we've got a part that's failing that we need to go improve, or we've got a part that's passing that we're happy with. Now, in both those situations, there's opportunity for a next step. And that next step could be, if it's failing, what do I need to do to make it pass? And if it's passing, how much material can I strip out of it and still have it pass? that test. 
and we can obviously explore the model, explore different design considerations manually. We can, in the real world, we can build different prototypes to test that out. But it's great to have a little bit of automation there. So I, we're going to showcase two approaches to optimize this this bracket. We're trying to do it pretty quickly here. Um, and the first one is a parametric approach. And this is available as part of SolidWorks Simulation Professional. It's the optimization tool. What this does basically lets us modify individual parameters in the model. So model dimensions, material specifications, you know, basically numbers that are in the model. Uh, so we'll just grab my file again. Bear with me a second. Yeah. yeah, so we'll just look at this at the part level. All right. So you set up your stress analysis, you get your result. Um, but what we're able to do in the optimization interface is identify parameters that are interesting to us. So maybe, you know, I've got this lightning slot that I put in place. Right. If I could take out some, some weight through the middle of this component. Um, I'm committed to the width, right? That's the width of the thing I need to hold with this bracket, so I can't change that. But if I can light it in the middle, so I've asked the software to control the length of that slot and the width of that slot. I've also got a cutout in the front here that I've asked the software to control the depth of it. So I can define up to 20 of these parameters the software can go ahead and mess with. Um, I can define uh, a limit, you know, define, tell the software what's good and what's bad. So I'm considering in this case anything in 25,000 psi is good. Okay, and then I get a goal, and my goal in this case is just to produce the lightest piece of the uh, lightest material I can. So we go hit run on that, and what the software will do is build variations of the model and test them. Right? Based on a design of experiments type approach, it'll step through, and as I click through some of these examples, you'll see the model change on the screen. Look at what happened with the slot. Software is going to build and execute all of these individual variations. And as it's testing them all, it'll give me red flags when I'm exceeding my limits. I give me data about the mass of the part and the stress that the peak stress that's developed. Now this model here can be a little quirky in that the high stress is localized in a particular position. That's generally not a great thing for parametric optimization. Um, but this is what it's proposing is the best case. It's um, you know. 0.2-ish of a pound lighter than the original, which is fairly significant. It's over 10%, and um, you know has a stress that's that's in range. But the thing with parametric analysis is incredibly powerful. But it can only build the features. It can only modify the features that we've built in for it. Um, all right. So I can only mess. With, in this case, I'm only messing with the slot and the central cutout. Incredibly powerful tools, so much we can do with that, and I most frequently use it not almost as an automation tool, but as a way to throw sort of 20 different design variations at a problem and just see what it looks like. You know, which ones are good, which ones are bad, which features uh, are best. It's that automated building and testing of geometry that, that really, really helps you out. But we'll contrast that with a different approach. Um, and so Tim's going to take you through topology optimization. Similar goal, but a fundamentally different process. So similarly to, to Glenn's goal of, of lightening the bracket, uh, we can do that in FEA. Uh, one of the major differences is we, we coming into this, we treat the, mod, the entire part envelope as a design space. And what we do is we set a volume reduction goal. And now what Tosca optimization does is essentially soften elements until it reaches your targeted uh, reduction 
and it optimizes that for stiff and stiffness given a certain loading type. So using the same load setup and specifications um, that, that Glenn did where we have certain forces on each tab and uh, restrictions at each of the holes supporting it, we search through a, a bunch of solutions of the FE model to, to reach that final uh, final kind of optimized load path. So quickly I'm going to show you that we have um, we, we have loads on each of the tabs and we've, we have an FE mesh setup. So once we have our, our basic model configured and running right, what we do is we come in and we specify a design volume. So here we have some control over how much volume we want to reduce and I've set that as a constraint in this optimization to 55% uh, of the original weight. And from that and <clears throat> with, the, with the design objective of optimizing stiffness, what we can do is come in and solve for what material to remove. So <clears throat> that's a topology optimization where we essentially remove elements from the mesh and we, re we arrive at a final kind of ideal configuration of elements. Uh, we can check the, the uh, amount of material removed and we can show the, the displaced shape. So what you see here is sort of an organic removal of elements. We can feed that back into our CAD program and essentially trace the edges of these as loops to come up with a bracket that is driven by a kind of amorphous or uh, fluid boundaries on the on the uh, hole cutouts. So the next thing I'm going to do is after we've looped that original optimization through CAD and I've sort of reshaped and cleaned up the the hole cutouts a little bit, um, I also set up an uh, optimization on this refined shape. And so what that allows us to do is rather than simply removing elements to target a stiffness, we can target uh, reducing stress in, in this optimization. So similarly to the other optimization, we have an uh, obje objective function to minimize stress. Uh, the other one was to, to minimize um, strain energy or maximize the stiffness. And in this one, I've gone ahead and put in 5% of the volume back. So rather than reduction of 55% or sorry, 45%, I've said we want to go ahead and put 5% back and do that in a way that's optimal for reducing the stress. So I'm going to go into the result of that, which is if we look at the um, how much the elements at the edges are displaced, uh, the, the red area is anything that's positive and since I've added volume um, everything everything got a little bit larger but if we want to compare it to the original shape we can see that um, throughout the the history of this what it did is uh, it it added volumes to to blunt these high stress spots and <clears throat> The other thing that it does is any anywhere that really doesn't carry any load is going to have volume removed in a shape analysis. So essentially it just optimizes your placement of material to to best carry the type of loads that you have. Um, so it, to kind of recap the way these work, topology optimization will remove elements and give you your overall uh, part shape. You take that into CAD and then shape optimization can refine the part shape to uh, hit ideal targets such as stress or fatigue life. So we'll talk a little bit about what could be next in the course of uh, higher end design analysis. Um, this one covers some of the, the damage capabilities that we have. Uh, we can analyze self-contact through very large strains. We can look at in-depth uh, crack propagation models and uh, we can we can simulate large uh, displacement and you know many part uh, interaction through a test through this uh, like a car crash analysis like you see on the left 
<clears throat> we have some capabilities in composites to look at damage at a very detailed level. And we also have a fatigue tool, which we can cover in, uh, in later webinars, which is called EFISAFE. And this is a strain life fatigue tool, which gives you the ability to, to look, again, at the kind of fine details through these parts uh, to, to really isolate where you're going to have your biggest constraints on the part life. So with that, I'll give it back to Glenn. Great. And we'll uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up here. If there are any questions, we're more than happy to to take them. Um, feel free to send them in. But let's just wrap up here. One second. Just make this change over. Okay. So this is part of kind of an ongoing series that we have, uh, Solvex Month, uh, Simulation Month, and. We'll continue that through the next two Fridays at 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, next week, we're going to look at dynamic drop and fatigue analysis in a similar format. And then we'll, we'll look at solutions for thermal analysis at the end of the month. Um, but we also have a very detailed document that's available called our Simulation Buyer's Guide. It explores many of these analysis questions and options in, in a lot of detail. And uh, you can go download that. From, um, from our website. But if you want to sign up for either of those, um, either of those sessions, hotcrutches.com in the event section, you'll see a 3D solution spotlight segment to that. So with that, I think that brings us pretty much to the end of what we wanted to cover. We've got an eye out here for, for any questions, um, and we'll address any that come in. But otherwise, we thank you for your time. Um, this morning. Um, now we're the expert this afternoon on the West Coast here now. Um, and we hope to see you at us one of our sessions in the future. So thanks for, for joining us and uh, you know, let us know if there's anything we can do to, uh, to address those questions. <laughs>